Now, Pavarotti was a good friend. Hello. Welcome to The Revealing. I'm your host, Pavarotti, here to discuss the Idaho 4 case. As a disclaimer, this channel is for entertainment purposes. These are my opinions, I'm not here to slander anyone. So, with all that being said, let's get started. In today's episode, I'm going to open your eyes to some things that you probably haven't put together at this point. But as I do that, I'm going to continue my series on eliminating the circumstantial evidence that they're going to be using against Brian Koberger in court. Now, we're going to start with number three on my list, excuse me, number four on my list, which is the cast data, the night of the atrocity and prior to the atrocity. As I go through the cast data prior to the atrocity, I'm going to bust in the Copaca connection and connect the dots like they've never been connected before. So, hope you enjoy. Okay, we all remember this from a few videos back where I brought up all the admissible evidence against Koberger at trial. Now, since then, I have covered the vehicle identification of the Elantra at King Road, and I asked everybody their opinion, whether that was a factor or not at the end of that video, and it was unequivocally, no, that evidence has been annihilated by... Pavarotti and all of you. Next, I put out a video just a few days ago about Koberger's physical description by DM. I think we can all agree who watched that video. That is totally annihilated as well. So what has the prosecution got left for admissible evidence at this trial? Well, we've still got the one that everybody considers the reason they believe that he's guilty, and that is the DNR, the DNR, the DNA, the STR DNA sheath matched Koberger, right? And that's the one we're going to attack last. And when I attack that one, folks, I think you're going to freak completely out. But we've still got the cast data consistent with the Elantra movements the night of the atrocity. And then we have the cast data showing 12 trips to cell coverage area of the King Road prior to the atrocity. We're going to go ahead and take those two, and we're going to take care of those in this video right now. First, we're going to focus in on the cast data consistent with the Elantra movements the night of the atrocity. And I'm going to show you what they have as evidence, and then I'm going to show you what they're withholding as evidence as it relates to the night of the atrocity. Okay, starting with the PCA. On November 13th at approximately 2.42 a.m., you, uh, you can basically say Koberger's phone pinged, okay, because that's what they're following this cast data from is, is phone ping. So, 242, it pings the tower, and it was utilizing cellular resources that provide coverage to 1630 Northeast Valley Road, apartment G201, in Pullman, Washington, here after the Coburger residence. Now, at approximately 247 a.m., the 8458 phone utilized cellular resources that provide coverage southeast of Coburger's residence, consistent with the 8458 phone leaving the residence and traveling south. This is consistent with the movement of the white Elantra. And you'll see that at 247, it says his phone stops reporting to the network, and then uh, none of that is consistent with the phone being shut off or, or being put in airplane mode because they have no information on that, folks. So that is not evidence in any form or fashion if they do not have any information on it. All they know is his phone stopped reporting to the network at 247. So here's what they really know is right here on Northeast Stadium Way and Southeast Nevada Street at 247, his phone stops reporting to the network. So they're saying when they caught him on video at 244 going north through the intersection, 
that that's consistent with what they found on the phone ping of the network of his vehicle being in that area. So his, his network location data being consistent with seeing him at this intersection is what they're using as consistency of the cellular data. Now you'll notice it stopped reporting at 247. So he went up this way, it stops reporting. He's not reporting to the network when he comes back down at 252 and heads this way towards uh, Main Street, which is Highway 270. So that's all they have of his cast data in Washington State before the atrocity and it stopped reporting at 247. Now we go down here to at approximately 530, the 8458 phone is utilizing resources that provide coverage to Pullman, Washington, and is consistent with the phone traveling back to the Coburger residence. The movements are consistent with the movements of the white Elantra, which is observed traveling north on Stadium Way at approximately 527. So again, you go back to this. And this is at 525 where they start picking up his car on camera and they'll, they pick him up on camera here, here, up here on Bishop. And then the next one is again there at uh, Stadium Way and, and um, Northeast Nevada Street. So they're saying his cast data, because his phone started reporting to the network again at 525, and his cast data was picked up following his car during this direction, and they're backing it up saying it's verifiable because we have cameras as well. Now, what they're not saying is if they did not have these videos of the Elantra, that they would not be able to pinpoint that he drove this exact path. The data would have showed that his vehicle was in this general area. So they're saying his cast data is in the general area, but we're verifying the cast data because we have video of movements of the car. Now, here's the only problem with that. This is straight out of the prosecution's response to defendant's alibi statement. And it says, at the time of the unalivings, this is Bill Thompson's words, at the time of the unalivings, because the defendant's cell phone stopped reporting to the cellular network before the unalivings and continued to not report until after the unalivings. The location of defendant's cell phone at times other than the time of the unalivings is not proof of or relevant. Remember that. Let's see here. Let me show you what he's actually saying right here, folks. Because he just made Koberger's case for him in his rebuttal. Okay, so other than the times, the defendant's cell phone at times other than the time of the unalivings is not proof or relevant to the defendant's specific location at the time of the unalivings. That is Bill Thompson's argument on Koberger's alibi. Now let's apply his same argument to what they're trying to use as evidence against him for his cast data because it's the same phone evidence, right? This is the map of Moscow, Idaho over here, and this is Pullman, Washington. The only cast data that is Koberger's phone that is verifiable is between 525 and the time he got home and 447, or 240, 247 when he left and 525 when he got back because in that they can take his cast generalized location and verify it with video. Nowhere over here is any information available during the time of the unalivings based on what Bill Thompson just said. He just said there's no data, it wasn't important to the network. So you can't use any of that as alibi. Well, in the same respect, he can't use any of it as proof that Koberger was at the unaliving house. And the way that he made that statement, he just said that evidence outside of the time of the unalivings was not relevant to the case. So the cast data, the night of the unalivings, 
totally not relevant to the case based on Bill Thompson's own statement. Now, we also see this additional cast data showing at 448 when his phone started reporting back to the network that they're estimating that Mr. Koberger was south of Pullman, excuse me, south of uh, Moscow, Idaho, just a little south of Blaine, north of Genesee in this general area. And then they had a little route that goes all the way back up here to 525. The problem with this route is it's all cast information. Nothing, not one camera verifies the location of the vehicle on this route. So they cannot coincide and corroborate the cast data with a camera sighting. So that means all of this is a guess. And let's go to Twizzle Sticks. Um, cell tower uh, display in this area for this next example. And here you go, you can see this is the coverage area of that tower. So because you're in the general area, it doesn't matter if you're over here or if you're up here, you could be down here. But you could also be over here and you wouldn't know the difference because it goes off of the distance from the tower to where you're at. That's what that's the distance report. So if you're right here, you could also be right here or right here. So there's no way for them to, to nail down a location based on that. And we know that's a fact because we've seen Brett Payne actually say that in testimony in court. Yes, ma'am. So Special Agent Ron Hilly with the FBI was also co-located with us. He was tasked with analyzing that video from WSU and the surrounding area. So it was a conversation between he and I uh, pointing out areas of location where the car was likely seen on surveillance footage. And that's what I relied upon to create that map. So you created that map? Through PowerPoint, I believe, ma'am, memory serves. You saved your work on that? Yeah, ma'am. We'll go to the next map. That one would appear to be a trail or a path from south of Moscow back towards Lewiston or back towards Pullman. Is that right? Yes, ma'am. Where did you get that map? Same thing, it was just created using uh, open source satellite imagery and into a PowerPoint. Did you create that? <clears throat> yes, ma'am. Where did you get the information to draw that trail? So that was used from the cell phone records referred to me by uh, Special Agent Balance on his interpretation of possible places where someone could have driven between the location that it starts there and then back to home. So you did this on some open source mapping, not anything from Nick Balance creating a, a visual for you? No, ma'am. I did view a draft report from Special Agent Balance to help me conceptualize this, but it did not look like this map. Okay, so we can now eliminate the cast data consistent with the Elantra's movements the night of the atrocity. Not admissible. Now the last one though, the cast data showing 12 trips to cell coverage area of the King Road prior to the atrocity, that one we have to look at at a totally different perspective because that one is evidence that only makes sense from a totally different perspective. And when we get into that evidence, we're going to have to go back to what I just showed you on the cast data consistent on the night of the atrocity as well. Um, because here's what we know. This 12 trips, it's certainly not surveilling and it's certainly not stalking. Did this covert allegedly stalk one of the victims? Yes, I was trying not to say that. Because but but, you, but you, knew, you knew that was false. So if it's not surveilling and it's not stalking, then how do we justify the 12 trips? There's only one way, folks, and that's where we bring in Brent Kopaka, because he is the co-defendant in this case. And when we look at this evidence through the lens of Brent Kopaka being the co-defendant, now the evidence starts to actually make sense. Their strategy starts to make sense, and a lot of things start to make sense when we look at it from this perspective. Allow me to elaborate. Now when we go back to this initial camera footage of the Elantra in Washington State from 244 to 252, 
align it with the cast data ending at 247. And we learned that, let me make it where I can write on this real quick. But we learned that down here, there is a camera on Bishop Boulevard that would have caught the vehicle if it passed that way. So when the vehicle comes down this way, we know that it did not go this way. What is this really trying to show? Folks, it's trying to show that the vehicle came up and went right over to here, to this place right here before it left Washington State University. Then, when the vehicle came back to Washington State University, again, it's coming up and going this specific route shown by every camera. And as it comes by right here, you'll see this little yellow thing circled. It's showing the movements of the Elantra going right by that location. Now that location is coffee house apartments right here. And you can see that on the return trip, the vehicle is coming up East Main. It could simply stop right here, let the passenger out, and the passenger can walk straight down the hill to those apartments. Now that's a pretty steep drop off. We'll see here in just a second. And on the way out, he came down, took a right, circled back around, to the same coffee house apartments. Let me show you. Okay, so we see right here, this is the front view of coffee house apartments where Brent Copaca was residing until he was unalived by law enforcement. And let's see here, this is, this is the front. You know what, I always thought this was in a better spot, but now that um, I kind of look around, I see this is kind of a, kind of a rough looking, little spot. Looks like a, a nice apartment complex, you know, from all the videos. And I just kind of pictured it in a little bit different area. But no, this is a pretty, pretty rough little spot right here. Um, and you can see, let's see, up here, let's see, well, now leasing over here, that's a rough looking little spot there too, to be right on the edge of Washington State University. And, but you can see that hill as it goes up there. And let's go down the road here just a little bit. Okay, and uh, you can see it's kind of in its own little world here. But look at this, how it goes straight up the hill there. And the, you know, the main road up there at 270 is, you know, kind of straight up that hill. Oh, well, look at there, we've got five units available. Yeah, so you see you'd have to traverse this hill to get down there from the road. Oh, wait a minute, what is this? Oh, look, here are these steps going up, those rails right there. Those are handrails going up steps into the woods there, it looks like. Oh, and it kind of comes across, and it goes to more steps. Oh, okay, so there's a stairway leading all the way up to the road that comes down directly to the back of Coffee House Apartments. So you can come right down that stairway and right to your apartment. Okay, interesting. Let's take the the drive up there and look at it from the road. So let's take a little trip up here from Coffee House back to Main Street or 270, whichever you want to call it. Yeah, let's see, is this little road here cut through? I don't know if that cuts through or not. Let's go on up here. That's a rough looking little spot right here too, huh? Oh, it doesn't look like a great neighborhood there. A sofa or something out there. All right, so here's the main road where it connects to the road that goes to Coffee House. You can see Washington State is just up on the left, it says. I don't see any cameras right here. So no cameras. Let's just head back up the road here. And we'll come up to the intersection up here. And um, here's that little gas station. Uh, the intersection of Stadium Way and East Main or Highway 270, whichever you want to call it. And here we are back to that intersection. And now we're in uh, September of 2022. Let's just make sure that they didn't have any cameras there in September. Last time I did July. Nope. Still no cameras there. So 
Nothing would have caught them at that intersection. Here's Washington State University. All right, let's move dump truck. Okay, here we go. As we head just a couple of blocks down, you can see there's Coffee House Apartments right there, right near this intersection. Get a, a side view of the back of them right there. Yep, there they are. Which one of those is Copaca's apartment? But look at this handrail right here. And look at those stairs. I'll be dang, look, it's metal stairs. They go right here from the road and they go straight down the side of that hill right to the back door of the coffee house apartments. So, interesting. This is what they're trying to show us with all the camera footage and all the cast data of him leaving and coming back to the WSU campus. So, as we come around, again, there's Coffee House Apartments down there. Copaca lives, or lived. And, uh, I don't know which one of those was his, but you can see is the return trip. He would have been driving right along through here. Stop the car, let Copaca out. And then Copaca simply could have walked across the street to the sidewalk. Here you go. Just walk right over there. Go up just a little bit. All right, so right here, okay, right here. So he's heading up this way. Here we go. He's heading up in the right-hand lane to make a turn. He stops, lets Copaca out. Copaca walks directly across the street to his steps straight down to the coffee house apartments. And this would have been about 527 or between 525 and 527 when he was seen on on uh, Bishop Boulevard and then when he was seen on Nevada Street and Stadium Way. So in between 525 and 527 is when he would have dropped off Copaca. And that's what they're showing you right here. And this is important because they're using Copaca as the co-defendant in the case. And I've made the case strong that the assailants were not setting up Brian Koberger in this atrocity. They were setting up Brent Copaca. They left Copaca's knife sheath at the scene to set him up. And when I get to the last video in this series, I'm going to blow your mind with how this thing panned out from there. But there you have the reason for all of this evidence they're going to be using. Now when we see one of these occasions on August 21st, they're digging into the historical cask records. August 21st, 2022, the 8458 phone utilized cellular resources providing coverage to the King Road residents, providing coverage to the King Road residents from approximately 1034 to 1135. Now we've seen in those rear, those new um, documents that came out that he said that the vehicle was near the King Road residence, not at it. And that's because it says it's providing coverage to the King Road residence. It doesn't mean it's, it's pinpointing the location. At approximately 1137, Koberger was stopped by Laytal County Sheriff's Deputy Corporal Duke, as mentioned above. The 8458 phone was utilizing cellular resources consistent with the location of the traffic stop during this time. So again, they're going to use cast, historical cast data on the location and corroborate it with a verified location during a traffic stop. But allow me to show you something here, folks, because it says from 1034 until 1135 that his phone utilized cellular resources providing coverage to the King Road residents. So that means he was in or around the King Road residents from 1034 until 1135, one hour and one minute. And then he left that area, and then at 1137, just two minutes later, he's pulled over by Corporal Duke at Farm Road and Pullman Highway. Now let's analyze that, shall we? 
Here is Farm Road right here and Pullman Highway. This is where he's pulled over by Corporal Duke. It said that two minutes prior to that, he was in an area that provided cell coverage to the King Road residents. He was there for an hour. Now, when you look at the King Road residence and you Google map it to this spot right here, you'll see the fastest route takes five minutes. So if it takes five minutes to get from here to here, then that means either he wasn't at the King Road residence because this is a two minute drive from here to right here. And if it took five minutes and he left there at 1135 and he's picked up at 1137, he couldn't have been at the King Road residence. Either that or the cell tower or the cell coverage area that provides coverage to the King Road residence is probably this general area like this. So he could have been anywhere in this general area right here. And he left the coverage area right here at 11.35 and he was then um, pulled over right here at 11.37, two minutes later. So that's as close right here is as close as they could get him based on what they said in the PCA to the King Road residence down here. Because if he's picked up here at 11.37, pulled over, and cell coverage said he left the area of the King Road residence at 11.35 right here, that's as far as he could get in two minutes. He couldn't get all the way to the King Road residence. So they can't have it both ways. But here's what I want to share with you. The whole reason for this is like you see in the traffic stops. Now I want you to look at the difference between Corporal Duke's traffic stop and the one that we've all seen from WSU from the body cam that was released. In October 4th, and this is the same guy supposedly, Bill, um, I mean, Brett Payne, writing both of these, right? He's writing this one and he's writing this one. Well, look how he wrote this one. On October 14th, 2022, Brian Koberger was detained as part of a traffic stop by WSU police officer by a WSU police officer. Doesn't say. Upon review of that body cam and report of the stop, Koberger was the sole occupant and was driving his Hyundai Elantra with these plates. Shouldn't it start the same way up here? But look, up here it's different. Further investigation, including a review of Latal County Sheriff's Deputy Corporal, Corporal Duke's body cam and reports, and uh, that's kind of kind of Latal County Sheriff's deputy, right? The sheriffs, you know, they're not involved in this investigation, right? Just the just the Moscow Police and Idaho State Police. No reason to involve those sheriffs in this. Showed that on October 21st, Brian Koberger was detained as part of a traffic stop that occurred in Moscow, Idaho, by Corporal Duke. At the time, Koberger, oh, who who was the sole occupant? Why is that so different than the way it was down here, right? Koberger was the sole occupant and was driving a white Hyundai Elantra. At the time, Koberger was driving a white Hyundai Elantra, and then they just kind of inserted was the sole occupant. Folks, you know why they did that, and that's why they won't release the body cam footage on this, is because he was not the sole occupant of that vehicle. Koberger and Kopaka was pulled over by Corporal Duke. What they're doing with the historical cast data is they're showing a history of Koberger and Kobach, Kopaka together going to the area of the King Road residence prior to the atrocity. And that's going to be very important as we move forward. So, as far as relevance to the Koberger case, you take out the Kopaka angle and no, absolutely no relevance because it can easily be proved based on their own statements that he wasn't at the King Road House on the prior occasions. They even say area in their own statements. So again, nothing, nothing admissible. The only thing they've got left is the STR DNA from the sheath matched to Koberger. And folks, that's where the Kopaka angle comes in like you will not believe. When I unveil what I have found on this aspect of it, you are going to freak completely out. That's what's really going on, folks. Now, as we get into the last evidence against Brian Koberger, which is the STR DNA matching to 
Koberger's DNA from his buccal swab. Remember how you pronounce buccal? I pronounce it buccal. That's where I'm going to open your eyes because that five octillion match is only five octillion if you look at it in a certain way. And it certainly isn't the way that you and I would look at it. So I'm going to break that one down. And when I do, you're probably going to get mad when I do that one. But on a side note, since I'm not getting political on, it, on any of my Idaho 4 content. I am starting a second channel, though, that's going to run between now and the election on election coverage. And if you would like to follow me on that, I'm creating it now. I will give you the information in the next video. If you, if you like my content and you know my point of views, then come follow me. If you don't like my point of views on certain things, then stick to my content on the Idaho 4. I appreciate you here as well. But please like and subscribe to the channel. Post your comments, thoughts, criticisms. Until next time, Pavarotti is out.